Honestly, yeah, I don't think I'm All right, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so we're kind of jumping like one class ahead in the schedule. Um, mostly because at the beginning of the semester, it, it sounded reasonable to have a, a whole class on what is a small molecule. And when I sat down to make slides, <laughs> it didn't make as much sense. Um, so I'm going to assume that uh, you guys generally know what a small molecule is. Next day, uh, I'll get into uh, our D-Kit and some of the ways that, uh, that you know, uh, some of the tools and resources that we have to analyze small molecules. <laughs> uh, but today... I want to start with uh, how we represent them um, in uh, both in kind of like text files and things like that, uh, but also in molecular graphs, uh, and then uh, go over some of the details of graph neural networks, um, which are a powerful way to uh, to analyze those molecular graphs and, and do computations with them and on them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, so we need. Uh, molecular representation, and that really just allows us to encode chemical structures in in a format that we can you know that's computer parsable. So some of the uh, key representations that you guys should be familiar with the the first one kind of re really like the the workhorse is the smiles representation. This is really the most widespread. And if you, you know, do kind of any work in this space, you'll see these long strings of, of chemicals and they kind of look like chemical formulas, but, uh, but not really. Um, that's the, the SMILES representation and pretty much all of the um, chemi-informatics tools that are out there, they can, you know, they can input and output this format. So we'll, we'll walk through exactly um, how to read the format and, and how to parse it. <laughs> Um, there's uh, another representation um, called SMARTS that kind of builds on SMILES and allows us to uh, search for, for substrings within SMILES representations. There's a, a new format that, uh, that I think is kind of cool. Uh, I haven't played with it that much, um, so I'm not going to like get into the details, but I do recommend you guys look it up. Uh, it's called uh, Selfies, and it's almost like a more of a, a programming language in and of itself that's used to describe small molecules. Um, you should be familiar with uh, the INCHI identifiers, uh, and then really the, the most general format, of course, is uh, molecular graphs. Okay, so uh, we'll start with SMILES. So um, SMILES, uh, I think it was developed at uh, EPA or something like that, um, and it's the Simplified Molecular Input Line Entry System. It's been around for decades, and um, it's it's pretty simple. Usually, uh, you can put hydrogens in there. Most people leave them out. So if we looked at something like ethanol, the smiles representation would just be the heavy atom, so it'd be um, CCO, uh, and that's sufficient to uh, identify it as, uh, as ethanol. Um, <clears throat> it's very widely used. So if you're going to do anything in chemi informatics, uh, you have to be pretty familiar with it. Um, but it does have, uh, it has limitations. Um, one of the limitations um, from a machine learning perspective is you can write down a lot of things that look like smile strings uh, that don't actually, that can't be decoded into actual molecules. The vast majority of uh, strings that you make that you know, look like they're syntactically valid. Um, they <laughs> they're not uh, they're not molecularly valid. Like they they don't actually correspond to molecules. Um, <clears throat> so what that means is, if you wanted to let's say make a million compounds to screen against your protein target uh, in silico, and you know you you wanted to come up with a program that would just generate new smile strings that corresponded to, to small molecules that you could test against your drug target, uh, it's, it's a really hard problem. It's, it's really kind of a, an unsolved problem. Uh, also, um, there's limitations on 
um, being able to express uh, stereochemistry in, in SMILES representation. Uh, there, there are ways to do it, uh, but I, I will say like most people don't use them. So, you know, you'll get a lot of uh, data in SMILES format uh, on molecules that uh, where stereochemistry is actually important. Uh, and in general, in, in like most of the databases, um, the, the stereochemistry information is not there. Okay, um, <clears throat> the, the next one, uh, SMARTS. So really the thing to, uh, to know about SMARTS is, uh, you know, it's, it's a pattern mat uh, matching system. It's based on SMILES. And, uh, you know, so for example, you can define an aromatic ring uh, as, as shown in the example. So you have C1, CCCCC1, um, that would describe an aromatic ring. You can take that in the SMART system and then look for uh, larger smile strings that actually contain that, uh, that structure, okay? Um, it's it's a little more complex than smiles because it has to uh, recognize that internal structure, but uh, but it's useful. Um, <clears throat> I alluded to to selfies. If you're interested in this space at all, um, selfies are are worth checking out. Uh, so, like I said, this is more. It's almost like a like a programming language to. Um, uh, to, to generate molecules. And like one of the, the key advantages here compared to smile strings is every syntactically valid um, selfie actually decodes to, um, to a valid molecule, right? So you can, you can come up with um, your own system for generating uh, like selfies strings and so you can you, you know kind of randomly sample the the space of of selfie strings, and um, you'll 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 be generating molecules that you know then you can build um, at least build in silico and then try to dock them against your protein target something like that. Okay. Now just because just because you can come up with some means of like randomly sampling the the selfie space or randomly generating selfies uh, strings. I mean, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're not going to be biased in, you know, in the overall space of small molecules that are uh, that are there. Like you're not not necessarily going to be unbiased in the way you sample from that. Um, so, you know, there's there's more work to do than <laughs> maybe just generating like random syntactically uh, valid strings. Um, but uh, but it's a good start. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> INCHI is the international chemical identifier. Um, these are these are like um, pretty illegible. Okay, uh, so for example, the the ethanol. So in in um, smiles representation, ethanol is CCO. At least that's one representation of it. In INCHI, you know, I'm showing you here what the uh, what the representation is for for ethanol, and it's it's pretty complicated, right? Like I couldn't. I couldn't tell you how you're uh, supposed to read that. Uh, so what's the um, what's the usefulness of it? Uh, well, one of the main um, things that makes it quite useful is that um, it is uh, unique. So there is exactly one representation of, of ethanol, whereas in SMILES, there are many different strings that, you know, that, that will map to the, the same molecular compound. Right. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, so why does that matter? Well, it it matters because um, if you are searching around in the space of a particular lead compound, right, and and you're trying to identify like new il in silico targets that you know have some favorable properties or you, good binding affinity to to your target, things like that, you could be generating all these different uh, smile strings. And testing them, and you can come up with a bunch of leads, all of which are exactly the same molecule. And it's non-trivial to take two smile strings and say, "Hey, are like are these the same molecule?" You kind of the only way I know how to do it is um, you have to actually uh, take the string, build the molecule, build the other molecule, and then and then compare them. And that's computationally fairly costly. Okay, so. Um, with uh, Inchi, you can you can really like uniquely identify these things, and and so that's uh, that's useful. Or if you know if you wanted to 
um, make a hash table of, um, of different molecules, you, you know, you have to have a, a, a unique uh, representation um, uh, of the molecule and, and Inchi does that. <clears throat> um, I don't know a lot of people who use these, um, but one thing that's worth uh, mentioning is um, there's something called the canonical smiles representation. And so if you have a molecule, um, you can get the smiles representation and uh, next day and on the problem set, you guys will get familiar with RD kit. And that's an API that gives you a lot of functionality for, for doing, uh, you know, manipulating chemical structures. Um, you can ask it to not only, you know, give you the smiles representation for a molecule, but you can ask it for the canonical smiles. And so if you, if you put um, the same molecule in, and get the canonical smiles, those are, those are always going to be the same. So, so that gives you a little bit of the, the functionality of the inchi with the, with the readability of smiles. And then kind of the most general representation is molecular graph. Uh, and it kind of has all the information because there you can specify, you know, it's a graph where your vertices are your atoms, your bonds are your edges, and those atoms uh, will have a label right? Carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, um, and the edges will have a label. Single bond, double bond, you know, par partially resonant bond. So uh, you, you can basically completely describe uh, that, uh, that, that molecule in a molecular graph. Um, <clears throat> this is obviously uh, uh, useful. Um, not only for doing computation, but for uh, visualizing these, these structures. Uh, and in general, in the molecular graph, um, then there's a few options for how you store that data, right? Uh, you store the bonds usually in an adjacency matrix. Um, and then, you know, uh, th then you'll store the, the, the labels for the, for the atoms and, and, and bonds somewhere else. Um, so advantages, it's uh, quite, uh, quite intuitive. Um, but it's not really um, it's not really a compact uh, string based representation. So it's more something that you're going to do computation with, and then you know you, you might output it output those molecular graphs to Smiles representation or some other representation to um, to store it in a database, something like that. Okay, so uh, here's just a, a quick comparison of all the uh, representations. Um, uh, that, uh, that we talked about, kind of going all the way from uh, smiles to the uh, molecular graphs. Uh, and you can see sort of some of the uh, advantages and, and limitations of each. Um, <clears throat> and uh, like I said, smiles is the most widespread. So I'm gonna walk you guys uh, really quickly through the rules of uh, like how do we how do we take a molecule and, and generate its smiles representation? So um, first, uh, you know you're gonna look at all of the the atoms and the the bonds in the in the chemical uh, that you're looking at. Uh, and so for each atom, you're gonna uh, represent that uh, with this chemical signal. So in the case of carbon, it's just capital C, but for some of them, um, you know, let's say like sodium, uh, it's going to be uh, two characters, okay? Um, <clears throat> and uh, then there are also rules. So if it's two characters, you know, for, for sodium, it's capital N, lowercase a, um, and then lowercase with, uh, with carbon um, also has a special meaning, and uh, that means that it's uh, uh, carbon in an aromatic uh, compound or an aromatic uh, bond with within a larger compound. Okay, so you'll have uh, uh, uppercase and and uh, lowercase c that that have different meanings. Um, <clears throat> in general, you can kind of leave out the um, the single bonds, uh, and that's still a valid uh, valid notation. You can also uh, uh, represent them with um, with a single dash. Uh, for double bonds, you'd put in an, an equal sign. Um, uh, for aromatic compounds, you don't need to put in the, you know, the, the uh, single and the double, um, but you can, um, you know, you, you can put in an, an asterisk for those aromatic bonds uh, and the triple, triple bonds are, are hash sign. Um, 
period is uh, these are two molecule, uh, these are two atoms that like sort of go together. It could be an ion and it's counter ion, so like NaCl, uh, and those are um, connected with a dot. And so dot doesn't really mean anything. It just means these um, these two atoms, uh, like maybe logically, con uh, they're, they're connected, um, but they're not uh, covalently connected. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to to make chains of uh, of these compounds uh, in general, um, things get uh, kind of messy if if we put all the hydrogens in. Um, and there's enough information if we if we just use the the heavy chains to to infer where the hydrogens are. Um, so you can actually leave the hydrogens out, although you're you know you're also free to um, uh, to put them in. And um, <clears throat> so uh, chains are relatively straightforward. Uh, we also uh, in many cases will have uh, branches off of those chains. So uh, to represent a, a branch, um, we use uh, parentheses. And so whatever is in the parentheses, those are coming off of uh, the atom that uh, preceded those parentheses. And then after the parentheses, you know, we're continuing down, uh, down the same way. And of course, uh, just like uh, here, um, uh, in the case of nitrobenzene, you can have branches uh, within the branches, right? Um, or if you have, um, you know, you have your carbon, it can make four different bonds. So you can have two sets of um, parenthetical uh, uh, branches right next to each other. And those are both coming off of the, uh, the atom that uh, immediately preceded the, uh, the, the two sets of parens. Um, <clears throat> the really the, uh, the only other uh, main rule is that um, the notation for closing a ring. So, uh, you know, we looked at, uh, we looked at, uh, benzene, you know, we could, we could repre represent this aromatic compound just with a bunch of, uh, lowercase c's, right? So benzene would be, uh, basically six lowercase c's, uh, in a row, but we also have to specify then, uh, you know, which two carbons are connected. Okay. So the way we do that is, um, is with numbers. And so for benzene, we'd say C1, and that puts a marker on that, that first carbon. And then five atoms later, there's also, there's another C1. And so when we're parsing that compound, then uh, you know, we see that, that number duplicated and we know that uh, like that, that molecule is, is closed there. Um, and then uh, sometimes we might have looping structures, uh, you know, ring structures uh, within rings that we've we've already opened, uh, and you can see that with uh, with uh, naphthalene. So there's a um, the two signifiers. There's you know there, there's another uh, one, two, three, four, five membered ring kind of within the um, within the first one. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, we also specify uh, charges in, in SMILES notation. And so charges uh, go inside curly brackets uh, and they can be uh, plus or, or minus charges. Um, and then the, the maybe the last uh, uh, caveat to all this is, um, you know, if I have something like capital S, lowercase c, um, that could be probably in most cases, it's uh, you know a sulfur followed by an aromatic carbon, um, but it could it could be an atom of scandium. <laughs> I know what scandium is, um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, you can you can um, specify that uh, by by putting uh, square brackets around around the SC, and that and that will cause it to interpret it as. Uh, uh, as scandium ra rather than uh, sulfur and a carbon. Okay, so that's kind of the um, <clears throat> the overview of uh, the representations of the the full molecule. And in the homework set that you guys are going to do, um, we're we're going to go through uh, today. 
uh, graph neural nets. And, and hopefully, it, you know, it's going to be relatively straightforward for you guys to see how to take some of the chemical representations and put them into a graph neural net and um, uh, do some machine learning on that, try to predict different uh, properties of those, uh, those chemicals. So what are some properties that we want to predict? Well, probably um, like hydrophobicity, right? Because we know uh, that was important for, uh, you know, crossing the, the blood brain barrier. Um, we might want to, we might have a lot of um, pharmacokinetic data. So remember, we broke that down into absorption, distribution, metabolism, and, and excretion. Um, that's not something that we can probably do like a detailed first principles calculation on. Um, so, you know, there we might want to take some molecules, put them into our neural net if we have enough data and then try to tr like train a model that's going to, um, predict, uh, absorption for, for example, or, or some other, uh, parameter that, that we care about. So I hope by the, by the end of today's lecture, you guys, um, kind of feel comfortable and have some some inkling of like how you could do that using these molecular graphs. Um, but on the PSET, um, you, you won't have to go that far. Um, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to use a, a fingerprint of those molecules, which is also a, like a, a totally valid um, and quite effective way of doing it. And so the idea here is rather than building a full molecular graph um, out of, let's say, a smile string, something like that. Um, <clears throat> we're going to generate uh, a vector that encompasses uh, like a lot of the properties of the molecule that uh, that we're looking at. Okay, uh, so there's a number of different methods for doing fingerprinting. Probably the most popular is uh, Morgan fingerprints. So, so I'll walk through how those are generated uh, really quickly. So Morgan fingerprints, they're also known as circular fingerprints. Uh, I find that nomenclature a little confusing because uh, you can definitely make Morgan fingerprints of, of linear molecules. Um, but the idea is uh, the fingerprint is um, sort of centered on each atom, and then it's looking at um, a bigger and bigger radius from uh, from that atom, and 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 you know trying to see, uh, you know, like uh, uh, at first order, how many carbons are there? Okay, how many carbons are there that are surrounded by two other carbons? How many carbons are there that are surrounded by one other carbon and and a nitrogen and 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 and, and so forth? Okay, so it's it's really taking taking a molecule, breaking it up into um, little pieces of a size that you define, and then generating a fingerprint that that carries all of that information. And so these are, like I said, widely used for um, um, for for a lot of different tasks, um, especially you know in in this uh, quantitative structure activity relationship modeling, um, and you know you could even probably not uh, optimal, um, you know, these days when, when we actually have at least alpha fold structures of uh, all these different um, drug targets. Um, but, you know, you could potentially use these, you could look at um, if you have a particular drug target and you know a few of the, the uh, compounds that bind to it, you know, you could, you could screen for additional ones using, using Morgan fingerprints. And that's certainly been done in, in, in the past. Okay, so um, how do they work? Uh, well, like I said, each atom in the molecule is um, used as a center, and then substructures around each of those atoms are uh, are encoded. Um, <clears throat> once we encode those structures, so at radius zero, we're looking at only each atom by itself, and then we're going to take that atom and put it through a hashing function, and it's going to, you know, let's say it's going to pull out the number seven. OK, then we're going to go to our vector. And, and this is generally a vector that is uh, a binary. So it's a bit vector. And we're going to go, go to position number seven, or we put the number one there. And if we have another carbon um, somewhere else in the molecule, we're going to you know, take that carbon, put it in our hashing function. It's going to say seven. We're going to go to bit number seven, 
and see that it's already on and, and we won't do anything, right? So, so um, redundant structures within a particular uh, chemical, they're gonna get hashed to the same hash bin. And we're just gonna, um, we, you know, we have some flexible number of hash bins. Most people use like 1024 or 2048. And um, each one of those uh, bins is like a yes or a no. Does it have this, you know, um, this type of uh, uh, chemical structure? Okay. And so, as you can imagine, um, if we're looking at larger and larger pieces of a molecule, we might have hash bins, you know, hash bin number 38. Um, and there might be like two totally different um, types of chemical structure that map to, to that bin. Um, so, you know, these, these things can, um, they can overlap. And, and then we have two choices. Um, one, uh, we assume that um, that's pretty rare and we're just gonna ignore it. And we're gonna let the, you know, the deep learning algorithm uh, uh, take care of it on its own. Um, or uh, like, you know, we can, we can make a, um, a bit vector that's, uh, that's even longer. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so we can imagine um, starting uh, with an atom in the molecule, um, we'll build a, a substructure by expanding out to a specific radius. So uh, radius of two is often used. Uh, and um, then we're gonna repeat that for, uh, for all the atoms. And every, every time we look at an atom and we look at a particular radius, we, we hash that to a particular bit and we turn it on, right? So we start with a vector of all zeros and, and we just start like flipping them to uh, to one. Okay, so uh, here's an example of uh, how that might look. Um, so you can see I've got this alcohol at the at the top, and um, <clears throat> I can I can break it up into uh, like a number of different pieces. Those are each going to hash to um, you know a different part in this in this big bit vector, and then at the end of the day. Um, that bit vector is, uh, that's my Morgan fingerprint and I can use that in, in downstream computations. So the nice thing about this um, is it, it kind of captures, yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm curious, like if you're looking at the center carbon and like a pentane versus cyclopentane, would they have the same fingerprints? Like you only use like a radius of two or something? Yeah, so the, it, it, that's exactly right. So if um, so, the the question for uh, folks who are watching on video, um, if you had pentane or um, a, a, a pentane that was cyclized, um, and we're only looking at one carbon in in the middle, would it uh, would it map to the same um, place in the in the bit vector? Um, yes, it would. Uh, if we're if we're using radius two, right? Um, and so uh, that's you know that's maybe a reason why you might um, you might go to like a larger radius. Now the the larger the radius, um, the the more different types of um, the more different types of uh, parts of chemical structures that you can have. And so the more opportunity there is for collisions in your, in your uh, bit vector. So you're putting more information in there. And if you're gonna be learning based on that, um, you probably need more data to, uh, to be able to, uh, to train a model to, uh, to, to deal with that. Or you, you know, maybe you need a longer, uh, longer bit vector. Uh, and I will say that <laughs> when you specify, so if you go into RD kit, uh, and you say, okay, give me a Morgan fingerprint. I want, um, you're going to specify, I want 120, you know, 1,024 different bins in my bit vector. And I want to do radius two. When you put in radius two, it's going to give you all the chunks, um, you know, centered around your atom um, and include, you know, two bonds away. Uh, it will also give you the substructures that are just one bond away. And it will also give you the ones that are zero bonds away. So it'll give you the atoms too. So, so in general, um, if you're just using the internal uh, functions in, in RD kit, whatever you set the radius to, it does that radius plus all of the, you know, the, the smaller radii within that. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so what, what is the size of encodings on of CLs? The what? The size of the encoding of the new stream. So how, how scales so the molecule or the chip? Oh, uh, so the question is, how does the um, size of the, the bit vector scale with the size of the molecule? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't. So like when you when you um, generate a Morgan fingerprint, you say, I want I want a, a bit vector with 1024 different um, buckets, 1024 different, you know, uh, binary uh, bits in it. And then you've got a hashing function that's just going to take um, take all the molecular parts you have and, and hash it to one of those 1024 bins. And so no, no matter how you know if you in in the limit where you put an infinitely um large and random molecule and ask for its morgan fingerprint it's going to be all ones right because um you know if it's good hashing function uh it's it's going to be all ones because you will have hit every you know every every possible um bin oh okay so it's not necessarily reversible correct yeah <laughs> Um, and so, so that, you, you know, you, you, you can also, um, if, if you suspect that like you're, you have a lot of these big molecules, you're putting them in, you're getting, you know, lots and lots of, <laughs> lots and lots of ones, and it's hard to discriminate these things. Um, then, you know, maybe you need to either choose a different, like a smaller radius, or you need to choose a larger, uh, bit vector, or if you're putting in really big molecules, you're probably putting in like proteins and things like that. And, and Morgan fingerprints are not really a, a good representation for proteins. Like once you get to things of that size, you're much better off um, like taking the amino acid sequence and putting it into a protein language model, right? Because you know your protein language model has got, has got all the chemistry in there. It's um, it knows the structure, it can predict the, the missing uh, amino acids. So um, it's kind of like once, once you get to the regime where that actually becomes important, um, you're probably dealing with um, molecules that have different emergent properties. And so, so you're using a different representation. Okay, um, <clears throat> so, uh, but one of the advantages of uh, uh, Morgan fingerprints is um, they're easy. They give you one molecule and a fixed length vector. So then you can go straight to machine learning. You can plug those into a random forest or a, you know, multi-layer perceptron and, and just start like training it. And, um, and, it, and it, it's, it's usually pretty effective. Uh, and so you guys will do that on the homework. Um, okay. So, Fingerprints um, can be pretty useful, um, <clears throat> but they're only capturing um, pieces of, of the data. So maybe in the limit where, you know, you have um, infinite data, um, then, uh, you know, an infinite uh, uh, compute and training time, uh, it doesn't matter and, 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 and you can go ahead um, and, and, and use fingerprints um, but uh, they're they're not they're not giving you all of the information that's uh, in the molecular graph, right? So um, in the real world, if you're not getting good results just using fingerprints, then then you can you know you can think about using molecular graphs. So there's a mathematical representation of a molecule um, as a graph. So the the nodes or vertices are the different atoms. Uh, and there are different types of atoms, and and the bonds are are the uh, the edges, right? Uh, and so these are are pretty widely used in um, uh, QSAR modeling, as as well as uh, uh, structure based drug design. Um, okay, uh, this is largely redundant slide. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to represent, uh, the idea is we're going to represent molecules as graphs. So number of different uh, types of graphs, and I want to get a little bit general right now, because um, I think some of the things that we're uh, talking about, uh, the immediate context is uh, molecular graphs and computations that we might want to do on molecules. 
But um, all of the um, techniques that we talk about today are, are pretty generally useful, okay? And so I want you guys to, just like when we talk about AlphaFold, um, uh, maybe you guys aren't gonna go and design, uh, you know, like a, a new protein uh, prediction tool, but the way that they've taken a lot of the uh, concepts that were already present in deep learning and, and really um, customize them to, uh, to that particular problem, I found, you know, really fascinating and, and kind of inspiring. Um, and so I want to get a little general when we talk about graphs, because uh, for many of the, um, the projects that you guys are going to do in this class, um, they, they might really benefit from a, a graph-based approach, even if, even if your project has nothing to do with molecular modeling or small molecules. Okay. So <clears throat> what are the types of uh, graphs that, um, that we might want to look at? Well, uh, what I've shown you so far uh, are all undirected graphs. So a chemical bond doesn't really have a direction. A chemical reaction network, that's got a direction, right? We're going from like um, substrate to, to product. But a chemical bond generally doesn't, doesn't have a direction. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's generally what's used um, in, in modeling small molecules. Um, but we could have uh, we could have a directed graph, um, you know. So, for for example, in a, in a chemical reaction network, um, and then uh, if we have a directed graph, that might that might tell us like what direction information um, tends to flow in that uh, in that particular graph. Okay, uh, so you can imagine. Um, uh, taking like our, our walkthrough of a graph neural network today, uh, where we're really looking at information going both ways. And, um, you know, in, in, in some networks, maybe you only want information going one way, or maybe um, there's, there's a special directionality for information going this way. And so you'd have a whole, uh, you, you, you might put in all the reverse arrows, but you have a whole different parameter set that um, that determines how information flows the other way, right? Because you might not uh, you might not want it to uh, uh, basically use the same weights and the same parameters to to pass information in the forward direction as the reverse direction. Um, in general, um, you'll have a labeled graph. So if the if the nodes are um, identifiable, if you know, if it's a carbon atom versus a nitrogen atom, um, then, you know, they're going to start with uh, some labels. Um, you can even have labels on the edges, right? So um, uh, in, in the case where we're talking about a directed graph with the forward, um, forward direction and maybe put in um, a, a reverse arrow too, uh, those would have different labels and that's how the model is going to know um, to, to maybe use different parameters. Or in the case of a molecule, maybe a single bond, double bond, triple bond, and, and those are all different types of edges. Uh, and then, of course, um, in in some graphs, you can have uh, weighted edges. So maybe you have some a priori knowledge that um, you know information in this network is you know is is shared according to this graph, but information from this source is you know uh, is like more important in some sense. Uh, and, and so you can, you know, you can put all of that into the graph. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that's speaking like uh, uh, very vaguely, um, but in uh, internal to the model, uh, we need to represent these graphs. So there's a number of different ways that we can do that. The most straightforward way is uh, an adjacency matrix. And so that would be a very large uh, matrix that has all of the nodes as rows and all of the nodes as rows and all the nodes as, as columns. Uh, we'd have a zero if two particular nodes were, uh, you know, the like node I and, and, and node J have a zero if they are not connected and a one if they are connected or we might have an integer rather than zero, one, like zero, one, two, three, depending if it's single bond, double bond, triple bond. Um, and uh, so that would be our adjacency matrix. 
Um, <clears throat> it's going to be symmetric if we have an undirected graph, and it's going to be um, potentially asymmetric if, if we have a, a directed graph. Um, and in general, um, for many graphs, uh, these matrices are pretty sparse, especially if there's like many, many nodes. And so, you know, if we're looking at, oh, I don't know, like what, uh, what movies people like to watch on Netflix and we've got like a hundred million users, then, um, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make a, uh, adjacency, uh, matrix of, you know, size 100 million by, by 100 million. Um, so once these uh, graphs get quite large, uh, then you can just use an adjacency list. So for, for each node, you, you just have a list of, um, you know, what are the other nodes that it interacts with or some other, um, uh, some other sparse matrix representation. And of course, uh, you know, we can represent them um, as a visualization and, and that's all uh, often helpful in the um, understanding the basic concepts and, and also uh, debugging these things. Um, in the context of drug discovery and, and drug development, molecular graphs are, are quite useful. Um, searching for uh, similar chemicals, so if we have a lead compound uh, that we know has some binding affinity to our target, uh, and we also have, uh, you know, let's say we have a library of uh, two million different compounds to screen. Screening uh, your target with um, two million compounds is extremely expensive, okay? And um, <clears throat> in general, uh, there's, uh, there's gonna be a lot of people, um, let's say at, at your company who, uh, who are also you know, working on other targets and, and wanna use that library. So you know, you, what you might wanna do is, uh, okay, let's start a smaller screen in the general chemical vicinity of a few of the um, a few of the candidates that uh, that I know have some uh, have some binding, right? So you might use uh, use these things in, in identifying similar chemicals and 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 then narrowing down the the list of uh, uh, drugs that you're going to test in your initial screen. Um, talk about using these in uh, in uh, QSAR models to predict you know solubility or ability to cross a blood brain barrier or, you know, different ADME uh, properties, toxicity. Um, <clears throat> molecular graphs are kind of the substrate for graph neural networks, um, which are powerful models that allow us to, um, to, to work on graphs. Um, and of course, uh, they represent the full molecular structure, so we can actually use them in, in full-on uh, structure-based drug design. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can do that using uh, AI type tools, or we can use that um, with the, the energy functions that, you know, that we talked about uh, kind of the first day uh, uh, doing a protein structure. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I wanna get into um, geometric deep learning and graph neural nets. Uh, before I do that, uh, let's just recap uh, like a similar concept, which is um, the convolutional neural nets, right? So uh, really, these were um, these were good at uh, processing um, structure that was on a two D grid, and so in some sense, um, we can look at these graphs um, as uh, not entirely different than um, than than the images, right? Because you can imagine uh, we usually think about the different pixels as just being like laid out in a matrix, but we can think of each pixel being a node. And having it connected, you know, either vertically or horizontally to the to the pixels that are that are nearby. Um, and in general, with the um, with the convolutional neural nets, um, we saw that uh, we initially picked up things like uh, edges or gradients or textures, right? And then, and then we we took those. Um, those activations in, in those early layers of the, the CNN, and we, we combine those together to, you know, to pick up uh, maybe shapes. And, and eventually, like towards the end of that network, we were picking up objects like cats or dogs or cars or, or, or things like that, right? And so that's um, conceptually like kind of the same thing we want to do with these, uh, with these graphs.
Okay, so um, that kind of brings us to um, the concept of uh, geometric de deep learning. This is uh, this really refers to um, uh, kind of the extension of a lot of these deep learning techniques to um, either graphs or uh, like other other structures, um, and those other structures. Gosh, it could be, you know, imagine we had uh, like a three dimensional mesh. It's not it's not a it's not a grid with voxels, but maybe we have um, like a, a, a point cloud in in three dimensions and we have individual data points from from different, you know, different positions on that on that point cloud. And we want to be able to do some kind of processing there. And maybe we have so many points. We don't just want to put it into a densely connected neural network because we know like certain points are, are closer or farther to each other in, in, in three-dimensional space. So maybe that's a 2D manifold in a three-dimensional space. Maybe it's um, just a bunch of uh, like random points. And so um, geometric deep learning is, is uh, concerned with how do we take what we've learned um, from you know, some of these other processes and like, like I'm showing you here in the middle, this is uh, like language translation, right? So it's like a sequence, it's, it's, it's linear. Uh, on the left, you can, you know, that's like our, our image, right? And, and, and now we can think of the, the pixels as, as being connected in a, um, in a grid, but like kind of uh, in a graph, right? And, and our convolution was telling us, oh, look at, you know, look at the adjacent ones. Um, <clears throat> uh, anything that generalizes that to a graph or a manifold or you know a collection of points um, is considered geometric deep learning. Okay, and um, part of the um, the the way that uh, people think about uh, geometric deep learning is really looking at the um, uh, the symmetry properties and the um, uh, invariance and and uh, properties like invariance and and equivariance. Um, and uh, that's uh, th these are properties that uh, you know we're going to use in our graph neural networks for uh, for molecules. So I'll just uh, like define them very quickly. <laughs> so invariance is sort of what we see on um, on the left hand side, right? So I, I've got two pictures of a cat, and um, I've I've done a transformation. It's a, it's actually one picture of a cat, right? Um, I've done a transformation and I've, I've moved that picture. I've translated it, um, you know, uh, up and up and to the right. Um, <clears throat> in this particular model, and this particular model is, is pretty simple. I'm just feeding it into a, a, a CNN um, classifier and it's looking at that image and it's, it's spitting out cat, right? And so this, um, this particular model is invariant to the transformation that, uh, that I'm applying. But I might be doing something like more sophisticated. I might be segmenting out part of that, um, part of that image or transforming it in, in, in some way, uh, like we see on the, on, on the right. And so now when I, when I translate it, um, I sort of get the, the same result, but the result is, is translated um, uh, according to the same the same translation the same, uh, uh, transformation of the input data, and that's considered equivariant. Okay, and there's a number of uh, cases where in molecular modeling um, we want things to be either invariant or or equivariant. Right? If I'm doing a molecular dynamics simulation and I have uh, you know a, a, a position of you know each each atom in my molecule. And maybe there's bond vibrations, and it's you know getting bumped into by uh, by water molecules, and it's um, uh, you know moving around. So you know I have these uh, momentum vectors um, and, and position vectors for for every atom. If I if I now rotate my frame of reference, I like I need an equivariant response, right? I want all of those position and momentum vectors to be rotated as, as, as well. So they still make sense in, in, in the new frame of reference. Um, <clears throat> whereas if I'm, if I'm taking a molecule um, and I'm trying to predict its uh, add me properties 
or its binding affinity or its solubility, well, it doesn't matter if I rotate that molecule, right? Um, or if I translate that molecule, it's not gonna affect its solubility. Um, and so, uh, so I want models that, uh, that are basically uh, invariant. And <clears throat> so this is a key concept in uh, graph neural nets and uh, geometric deep learning. And uh, there's a number of ways to uh, enforce it. We can enforce, um, we can make sure that all the terms going into the model um, lead to results that are either invariant or, or equivariant. Um, or, you know, we can, um, uh, we can put that as part of our objective function, right? We can penalize the model for giving different answers to um, input that's, that's translated or, or something like that. Or, you know, in, in, in the past, um, people have done data augmentation. So, you know, we take our picture of a cat, we rotate it. Um, we flip it around, you know, like one of the axes and get a mirror image and, and, you know, we just put all, you know, we augment the, the data set to, to take care of that. Um, and, and that's great. But, um, at the end of the day, like, what if, uh, um, what if there's a rotation that just wasn't seen during our training set? Like we don't, we don't really want the, the model necessarily to, to fail. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if we, uh, if we're thoughtful about the way we construct the model and make all the um, operations in it, either invariant or, or equivariant, um, then potentially, you know, we, we can avoid some of those problems. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, in particular, um, the sort of like sub field of geometric deep learning that uh, we're gonna talk about today is uh, graph neural networks. Um, and so these are deep learning models that operate directly on graphs. Um, they are designed to capture the relationships between uh, the atoms and the bonds, the, the nodes and the edges of, of a graph. And um, <clears throat> we're going to try to use these uh, use these graphs to make predictions. And uh, you know, we we might be predicting um, a property of each um, molecule in the graph, um, you know, like, oh, is this molecule, is this one going to bind to the active site and undergo a chemical reaction? Uh, maybe, maybe we're predicting something about a bond. Like, can this molecule be cleaved at this site by this enzyme? Um, or we might be predicting a property of the entire molecule. So here's the molecule, what's, uh, you know, is, is, is this gonna cross the blood brain barrier, yes or no? Um, we could be doing classification, classification, or maybe a regression. We might say, like, what's its what's its solubility? Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's skip that. Okay, so so let's let's look at an example. So uh, here's an example problem that we might have. Uh, so we have these nodes connected uh, on uh, on some uh, some initial graph. Um, that describes the, the relationship uh, between all the nodes. And we have some input data for each node, right? So say it's a, a, a vector of numbers here. Um, and uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take that, uh, that input data and uh, I'm going to uh, go through an initial uh, embedding step, right? and come up with some latent representation of kind of what's going on at that node. Um, there might be for particular problems, for particular graph problems where the graph is already known um, and um, you know people have solved this problem before, maybe you can reuse those embeddings. In general, you'll probably have to learn new embeddings um, you know, for, for, um, for your particular model. Um, and then we're going to start with um, that initial graph where each of those nodes has some, some latent data embedded. So I'm, I'm kind of blowing up the, the gray node, but we can imagine there's a, there's a similar uh, latent vector um, on, on each of those uh, like five different uh, colored nodes there. We're going to take that network. Um, and put it through some number of um, GNN layers, 
Okay, you can almost conceptually think of these as CNN layers, right? Because in our convolutional neural net, we were passing information um, between like adjacent pixels that were near each other um, on, on that like grid shaped graph. Now the graph isn't shaped like a grid, but we can still imagine the same type of uh, type of operation. And so, um, you know, think of these GNN layers as, as kind of being like uh, uh, com uh, convolutional layers. Um, and we're going to go through some number of them. Okay? Uh, and then we'll end up with our with our final state and um, move this so we can see there's not much to see. It just says the word output. <laughs> Um, but we're going to, um, use the, the final state of all those nodes to, to generate some output. Yeah. Can I make a quick announcement yeah. about something for Manolis? Uh, Manolis might be joining us between Friday to Sunday for this, uh, computational biology and unconventional computing research hackathon at the Media Lab. Uh, Stephen Wolfram is going to be coming, Ayo uh, Shaba, a bunch of other people in longevity and biology. Manolis, I believe, will potentially be joining because I'm interviewing him later. Um, so kind of just put like the link to that thing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, that's that's exciting. Thanks for that uh, uh, announcement. So, um, so we're starting with our initial embedding. Um, we're performing some number of operations, pass information back and forth, uh, and then we're going to generate an output. Okay, um, that's the the overall workflow. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> so what's happening in that GNN layer? Um, well, there's a few steps. And the first step is um, we're gonna we're gonna pass messages, okay? And so uh, we're gonna take that latent representation for each node. And so here, I'm focusing on the yellow node. And the yellow node in that graph is connected to like both the pink one and the gray one, right? And so I, I want to figure out, so the pink and the gray, they're both sending messages to the yellow node. And those messages are going to be based on their um, the, the current latent vector or hidden vector uh, that's associated with those nodes. Um, but I'm probably going to modify it in some way, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weight different parts of it uh, differently. Um, and so, you know, in, in practical terms, I'm probably taking that vector and I'm multiplying it by a matrix and the parameters of that matrix. Um, well, the, you know, those are the learnable parameters in, in my, uh, graph neural net, uh, model. Okay. Now, uh, this is a key step. Uh, it sounds very simple, but, um, <clears throat> uh, this is where a lot of things happen. So I need to aggregate those those messages. So what are the different ways I can aggregate it? Well, you know, I, I've taken those latent vectors, I probably multiplied them by some matrix, so now I have some new latent vectors. I can just add them to the, um, to the vector that's currently at the yellow node, right? Um, that seems very reasonable, but let's think about this. What if, what if one of my um, nodes in this network is only connected to one other node, and then I have a different node in the same network that's connected to 20 different nodes? So if I just add it, um, if I just add it, it might be uh, uh, like really overweighting um, the, 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 the value at the, at the node that, that has more information passing in. So I might want to normalize it by the by the number of connections, okay? Um, or I might not, right? And this is this is all gonna um, come into you know designing this thing ahead of time and and trying to understand like you know so for the data that I'm putting in, does it make sense to normalize or does it make sense not to? Um, <clears throat> the other thing is when we thought about the the convolutional neural nets, remember we looked at that one example filter. And it was um, it was it was a row of um, negative one values, zero values, and then positive one values or uh, sorry columns. And remember that was like a that was a vertical edge detector, right? So um, <clears throat> that's something interesting we can do with a with a convolutional neural net 
that um, we can't actually do with a GNN. Why, why can't we do it with a GNN? Well, we don't, like in the convolutional neural net, we were always guaranteed that there was, you know, if it's a three by three kernel, we were always guaranteed there was a spot in the upper left, spot in the upper middle, spot in the upper right, you know, we can raster across that three by three grid. And, and there's data coming from all of those points. In our graph neural net, we're not guaranteed anything. We're probably guaranteed that there's one edge, but we don't we don't even know is that is that edge coming from like the left hand side or the right hand side? We haven't even defined that. All we've all we've defined is the adjacency, right? And so this is a case where um, that uh, uh, invariance actually comes in. We need to come up with. Uh, a way to aggregate these uh, these messages that is invariant to permutations of of the input. So it doesn't matter what order um, we're we're putting those. Uh, it doesn't matter what order we're taking those input messages, right? So um, we can certainly um, we can certainly take those messages, certainly multiply them by some fixed matrix. We can add them together. We can do all of these things. But what we can't do is we can't, um, you know, weight them differently based on where they where they came from, or can we? We can probably come up with some way to do it, right? Um, so if we think about like what do we do with transformers? We looked at like well, what is the message in in this particular part of the sequence, or what is the message in in this you know particular part of the uh, of the node? Uh, and then use that to determine the weight, right? Because once we do that, uh, then whatever comes out of that is still going to be, you know, something linear, and it's not going to matter the the order that we add it. Okay, but these are um, sort of the things that that we have to think about with the uh, graph neural nets. Um, so we're going to aggregate those messages together. And we'll get some other vector, and then you know. Uh, Maybe we'll uh, multiply our uh, latent vector at the at the yellow node by some other matrix, and then we'll probably add them together, something like that. Uh, and <laughs> I'm being very vague here because there are a million different ways to construct a a, a GNN and and define all these steps. Uh, and, and you know, lots of people do different things. Um, but uh, so so I'm giving you sort of like a a, a very uh, like vanilla uh, view of it um, that that is uh, pretty typical um, and so so then we would we would update our node and then we'd repeat that for for each node in our network right <laughs> all right so um, this is like a like a vanilla GNN this is just exactly what uh, what I just described as kind of like a very simple update step so if my node embeddings um, are uh, like H, H sub U, where U is, um, you know, we, we'll just loop over all of the different U's where U is each node in our, uh, in our graph. Um, then if we want to compute, what's the, um, what's the kth? value of, of, you know, this, uh, this hidden state, this uh, latent vector at, at node U, um, it's going to be based on whatever it was, um, you know, at step K minus one, um, <clears throat> probably times some matrix. So we'll call it like W sub K. Um, and then, for example, we might take um, all of the nodes V that are, that are connected to the node U and we'll take those and we'll weight those by some some other matrix. It's probably a different matrix than than we use to to you know weight the um, the node at, at, at point U. Um, we're going to add those together. So that's our aggregation step. Um, this is also a step where like you know maybe we do something fancy and put an attention mechanism in there instead of just adding them together. Um, <clears throat> But same basic concept, and then maybe, maybe um, just like a you know MLP or something like that, uh, we would put in a bias term. Okay, um, so so we can imagine doing all of that. Uh, oftentimes, we might not put in um, 
put in a bias term and uh, then we have to figure out if it's, you know, if it's going to um, uh, be weighted by the, you know, the, the, the number of different neighbors it has or, or, or not. So, so there's a lot of design choices at, uh, at that point. Um, and then we're going to take that, um, that linear computation and we're going to apply our, our nonlinearity, right? So each, um, each layer of our um, graph neural network is, is going to have the same general format as, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a neural network in, in, in that it's going to have that nonlinearity applied at the, at the end. Okay. <clears throat> Um, here, just pointing out that, uh, oh yeah, we, we're just summing over these guys. So uh, that's uh, that's our permutation invariant step. Yeah, yes. But uh, just make sure if there's thousands of dollars in prizes for this thing. Wow. If anybody's interested. All right. Um, lots of press coverage we've gotten. It's going to be pretty big. You could totally come if you like to see free money and meeting cool people. And uh, I'll be there. You should come. And also... Of joining as well. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yes. Who are you? Oh, I'm Addy. I'm a neuroscience student. You're who? Addy, neuroscience student. Oh, okay. Hey, yeah. Nice to meet you, Addy. Nice Thanks for coming. Cool. Thanks for sharing your message. I'll be, when's the next class here, Tuesday and Thursday. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll see you then. If not, I'll be back. All right. Thanks, Addy. Um, okay. So, um, so we can talk about uh, as we're passing these messages, we're increasing the uh, the, the receptive field uh, around a certain node, right? So at uh, at step one, um, each node has information about itself uh, that it got from its input data and and an embedding layer. Um, but then after we pass through one um, layer of our GNN. Um, now our receptive field is, has increased, and now the, the gray node at the top has information from all of the nodes uh, shown here. And then after two steps, after two you know, passes through our GNN, now that gray node has information from everywhere in the graph, and maybe this is everywhere in the molecule. Okay, so um, we have some uh, additional design choices here, right? So you might say like, oh, well, we should just, you know, have like a very, very large number of um, GNN layers and then, you know, be like a transformer and like every, every position will have information from every other node. Well, um, it's computationally cost costly and oftentimes if we do that, um, then um, all of those nodes tend to um, get information that's that's a little too smeared out to uh, to be super useful, and so oftentimes, you know, we'll get um, equally good or even better results on a certain training set um, by having fewer GNN layers, okay? um, which is kind of good because then. Uh, we don't have to worry as much about exploding gradients or imploding gradients or, 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 or things like that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, now we've gone through kind of, you know, everything from how do we, you know, read in these, these molecules to how do we represent them as a graph? How do we, you know, perform some set of computations on them and produce um, uh, like a like a final output in the end, right? Uh, but like all these parameters we put in the model, all these matrices that we're uh, that we're multiplying by, and you know, this uh, embedding matrix and things like that. These are parameters in our model that we are training to um, perform some specific task. So what is that task, and how do we go from a graph that has um, new latent vectors at each node to making a making a prediction that may be right or wrong that 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 you know we can feed into a loss function and and, and now try to like optimize our parameters. Well, that depends. It depends what is the task that we're trying to perform. So one of the most basic tasks um, would be looking at this network. <clears throat> You can see here, and um, so so here we see 
we don't know what the value is. And here we've got a binary classification, positive or negative, right? Um, we don't know what the value is at the gray node, but we know what the value is at all the other nodes. So um, we might have something like this, um, and there may be one, there may be many nodes where we want to make a like a node level uh, prediction. And um, so, so then what do we do? Well, probably fairly straightforward. We're just going to take that, um, that latent vector um, that exists at that node, and then we'll put it into some, some classifier, right? Or maybe we'll do a regression with it. So that's really straightforward. Um, and it, it's going to give us node level predictions. All right, easy. Um, what's another task we might want to do? Uh, well, another task, a common task is link prediction, right? So you like get on uh, Facebook or Instagram and it says, oh, like maybe you should be friends with, uh, with this person. Like somebody's doing a, a, a link prediction on, uh, on your social network. Um, we may have, um, uh, like maybe we've done um, <coughs> like a bunch of uh, gene wise experiments we haven't looked at every gene in in in, in the whole genome but we found like an, a, a number of genes that are uh linked to let's say some disease uh and uh we also have like a lot of other interconnections between those genes so these ones are co-regulated these ones are um part of the same metabolic pathway blah blah blah, blah right so we have all kinds of nodes all kinds of um uh, links but the data isn't complete um, so like maybe, so we, we say like, oh, we know some of the genes involved in Alzheimer's, but we want to predict new ones that we think are going to be likely to, uh, uh, to be involved. And so, uh, that's link prediction, right? So, um, we're, we're postulating that there are additional links in our graph that, that we just don't know about. Um, so there, there's, uh, there's a couple ways we can do it. <clears throat> we're going to end up with, uh, latent representations um, for the, you know, like vectors describing each one of those nodes. And one of the easiest ways to do it is to take those latent representations and just say, um, uh, like how similar are they? Like if two genes are like uh, really similar, if we just take like a, a cosine similarity or dot product between, you know, between their latent vectors, um, and it's above some threshold, we can say, oh, yeah, like maybe maybe that's a link. Um, we could also just like take take those two inputs and then um, feed it into something fancier, like a, a multilayer perceptron or, or, or some other kind of classifier. Um, <clears throat> but the, um, the function that like we are gonna um, look at on the on the piece set, I don't know why I'm trying to move it. You guys know, <laughs> it's like a note there. It just kind of bothers me. Um, the application that we're going to use on the on the P set is, uh, well, we've got this molecule. We've got this molecule that's represented by a graph um, and we want to know its solubility. We want to know whether, whether you know, um, is toxic or crosses the blood brain barrier. Um, so now uh, we have a, a sort of a more interesting problem, right? Because uh, we've run our GNN. And we've uh, we've generated um, like a final latent state for each of our nodes, but um, every molecule that we put in is is going to have a different number of nodes potentially, and we need to uh, we need to combine all of those different nodes to to say something more general about the molecule as a whole, right? Because there may be very hydrophobic parts of our molecule, but then there may also be very hydrophilic parts or charged parts. And so we can't just look at one node and predict whether this thing's gonna be soluble in water. Okay, so what do we do? <laughs> well, there's a number of things we can do. Um, one is, uh, you know, we can take, we can take all those nodes uh, and we just add them together, okay? 
maybe that's useful. But we talked about this before when we were talking about aggregating messages. Um, some graphs are bigger than others. So do we want to add them together or do we want to normalize and, and just take the mean? So, so that's another decision that, you know, that we might make um, based on the, the task that uh, uh, we're trying to accomplish. Um, another might be um, looking at uh, all of those uh, latent vectors and, and taking the max, okay? Uh, and we'd have to define what the max uh, actually means um, in that latent space. Um, we can also um, use something like an attention-based mechanism to figure out how much of each of those vectors, how much should we count each of those vectors? Um, and, you know, we can use an attention-based mechanism to, to do that. And then um, those are some new weights that, that we can learn, you know, kind of how to use the, um, that attention mechanism. And uh, there's a million other ways to do it too. Okay, we could put uh, we could put a like an, an extra hidden node that node that's not in the graph that is connected by special edges and has its own special like uh, update function. You know where every node passes information to it during during message passing. There's, there's you know um, as as many ways as you are creative to um, you know take that final output and um, get a fixed length vector at the end. Uh, and then once we have that, uh, then we can use that, put that into a classifier or, or you know, um, uh, regressor and, and uh, make our predictions. Okay. And, uh, oh, and that is it. That's it. Okay. Uh, perfect timing. Um, I will see you guys on uh, Tuesday, and then we'll dive a little bit deeper into um, some more specific applications. Homework three, Jared? Yeah. Yeah. Uh it's released and the recitation tomorrow will be on just like showing you guys like basically neural networks and stuff and small modules and then a Gaussian problem and then some extra topics for like modules. Okay, so there's a lot going on at recitation yeah. tomorrow, so you guys should all try to show up or, or tune in online. <laughs>